Hi folks, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency. I wanna share a little different kind of story with you this weekend. So usually we do numbers-based science stuff on this channel focused on understanding our climate future. This video is not science stuff. I wanna do a little show and tell here about an unusual gift I received from the land this growing season, what I learned about it, and how maybe it can help you put uh, your emotional response to climate into a less individual and alone perspective, more of a, a big human perspective. So in my life away from the screen here, I spend a lot of time engaged with the land. I grow a lot of food on our property for my family and for other living things. I would not say I have a typical permaculture approach to my land work. Typical permaculture is often based on optimizing a landscape for human food production. Whereas I try to tune my landscape towards plant diversity and resulting insect population, Human food production is my secondary concern. It seems weird, but like insect populations are collapsing all over. I don't especially love bugs, but I love living things. And bugs are foundational to the ecosystem. When I thought, uh, in 2020, I thought a lot. When I thought about my power as a human on the earth at this time, I came to the conclusion that I could provide habitat for a heck of a lot of bugs. And on my property, I do. I would say I am a very successful bug farmer. You might think this means that uh, bugs eat all my crops, but they don't, not so far anyway. I have high bug diversity with lots of predatory species that keep potential pests in check. And alongside the increases in bug diversity, I've had increases in bird diversity. Birds, they're also big bug eaters, right? So far, I've been blessed with good crop yields that have continued to increase as I develop my skills and my relationship with the earth. Part of my good yields are from the good, diverse pollinator populations that are living with me. But pollinators don't help every plant. Pollinators have no impact on corn production. Corn is pollinated by wind. This is the first year I grew corn on my property. I've tried to grow corn at other locations. It turned out real bad. This year, my corn, I planted it in a circle. I figured I wasn't planting much of it, and that way it'd get some pollination regardless of the prevailing wind. I planted the corn with squash. I didn't get the beans in in time. Next year, I hope to do better. And I did a lot to document this corn, both because I love the corn and because my youngest was the one who literally begged me to plant corn and I love her. I have shown you a lot, but I haven't shown you this yet. Let me get it. So this is a strange corn cob, isn't it? I think it looks very like the body of a woman. You can see it is this way naturally. It's not a constructed object. It's a natural object here. This is uh, fully dry now. It was somewhat more lush at the moment of harvest, but it, I still think it has a very unusual appearance. And I had an unusual emotional moment when I beheld it for the first time. I felt very happy and fortunate. And I had this impulse to thank some great force for speaking to me. And as you can see, I saved the object. After a few months, I felt like I could show someone else my magic corn. I was very secretive about the magic corn for some time. I knew who to show though. I have a couple of friends who do ethnographic work up in the highlands of Colombia and Peru, where there's a big density of indigenous traditional knowledge. The woman of this pair, she's from a highland village. She's a native there. She's a total dynamo too. So I showed them this object and they jumped. They're the same as I was. They were very happy and excited to see this object. And then they sent me this paper to tell me what the object is. Let me show you. So this object, it's called many things, but one of the biggest, the most encompassing names is Mama Sarah or Sarah Mama. It seems like the syllable order doesn't matter so much. I, they sent me this in English and in Spanish, but in the Spanish, the picture quality is better. Let me show you some of these things. So there's a traditional interest in like all of your weird corn, corn that's stuck together, corn that has unusual grain fill, and corn with unusual color combinations. Here we see uh, Donna Justina Tiespi showing a really nice Mama Sarah that she's been holding on to it for a couple of years. She's one of the informants who helped to give the evidence for this paper my friend sent me. We can see in these traditional jars, these are cool artifacts, long-standing interest in the way that these bridge the gap between human and vegetable expression in corn. 
And check this out. I thought this was really cool because, you know, there's not a lot of silver work that survived the Inquisition. The Spanish were working to find and destroy these objects. But this sort of three-pronged Mama Sarah, it's called a Takisera, was believed to be especially powerful. And that's why sometimes the objects were made into stone or into gold or silver figures. And you can see this is very intense craft work here of these Takisera. That's because these Takisera were believed to have a special power of quelling El Nino. That's pretty rad. And I'm just talking about the context of it, these unusual cobs in the tradition, they're not considered to be typical objects, to be objects instead of agency. To say, we might say in English that they're emanations of the agency of the corn mother, of corn as a person. And the type of person corn is understood to be in this tradition is a person who is a mother. These um, objects continue to be believed to be very powerful and auspicious. You're supposed to keep them with your seed corn. You can talk to them and they like it if you drink with them, especially chicha, which I don't have any chicha. So I'm gonna see if other corn liquor is also appropriate. So I would really like it if this magical corn would help to alleviate El Nino, that would be very cool. I also like the idea of drinking with corn and I'd like to say thanks, corn mother, as you are emanating through this agentic corn. I really, I'm excited to be in communication with you. I do not expect all of you viewers necessarily to be like jumping right on board as we are a science channel here. So let's get back to some science topics. And that El Nino, it was, you know, quite well understood in the traditional pre-conquest culture because El Nino is a real butt kicker in that part of the world. People feared it. People learned to observe the signs. People were aware when it was waning and they developed many ideas around that. And the concepts that they developed were widely believed to have power. There are not a lot of the type of artifacts I just showed you pictures of left because the Inquisition actively targeted them for destruction. This tradition was one of the traditions the Inquisition sought to eradicate, to destroy even the memory of the tradition. But they failed. The tradition's alive today, and that makes me really happy. Oh no, like I said, I don't expect you to get super invested in my magic El Nino fighting corn. That's not the point for the more science-minded in the crowd here. Or though, you know, El Nino has really played a role in collapse before. It played a big role in knocking over the historical empires of Central America. We gotta remember that means people have lived through the emotional palette that we're living through right now. The fear we feel now, the hope we feel now, we're not alone. I find it meaningful to connect to these deep traditions and to our deep human experience here in the Americas, our deep traditions around what threats are present here in the multi-century, multi-millennia timescales. And I just think it's cool. So thanks for hanging out. We're gonna have a regular climate video back this Thursday, January 11th. Hope to see you then. Folks, thanks for listening in. And I'd also like to thank all of the donors and volunteers who contribute to American Resiliency. If you are interested in giving, please check out the donation link on our About page on the YouTube channel or go to our website, www.americanresiliency.org. We are a registered 501c3. If you send us direct donations, they are tax deductible. Thanks to the generosity of this community and both funding and time, we've really been able to step up the quality of our videos for these updated forecasts. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here with me. Let's get ready together.